Yeah, cricket, love the cricket is where we start this Thursday edition of the Sportsman Zone. Australia are in sight of victory in the first test against the West Indies at the Adelaide Oval. The Windies produced a respectable bowling performance, but then failed to follow up with the bat in their second innings, putting the Aussies in a good position for a day three result. The Aussies resumed day two on 59 for two in their first innings, replying to 188 made by the Caribbean side. Here's Gerard Morrisili with the day two recap. Here's Australia's number four, and Usman Kawaj and Craig Braithwaite. Guyanese speedster Shamar Joseph picked up where he left off on day one, producing a gem of a delivery to get rid of Cameron Green for 14. That was the catalyst for a successful session in the field. Justin Gray is removing Usman Khawaja for 45, and the Kimar Roach taking care of Mitch Marsh for five, limiting the Aussies to 85 for three as they went to lunch at five for 144. After lunch, the Caribbean side continued to plug away. Gray's, maybe the surprise package, ended with two for 36. The right arm medium getting rid of Alice Keary. Joshua De Silva holding on this time. A neat catch as well. Six for 168 at that stage. West Indies may be even harboring hopes of an unlikely first in his lead. But the number five batsman Travis Head was going about his business in fine style. The left-hander adding 54 for the seventh wicket with a Mitchell Stark before Shamar Joseph struck again. The 24-year-old getting his fourth wicket by removing Stark for 10. There was no stopping Head though. He'd bring up his second hundred against the Windies. Through the covers for four. Travis Head, test hundred, number seven. They have come in their thousands here to the Adelaide Oval and their golden boy has delivered for them. The left-hander went on to a top score of 119, coming off 134 deliveries before Azari Joseph had him caught by Kevin Hodge. And then it was time for Shamar Joseph to bring up a milestone of his own. Straight through, Shamar Joseph. A five-foot on his test match debut and boy has he deserved it. Australia eventually bowled out for 283, a first in his lead of 95. Sadly for the Windies, though, their batting lineup could not replicate the brilliance of their bowlers. And again, Josh Hazel would prove too much to handle, snatching the first four wickets. It started with Tayshan Ryan Shandapal for a duck, and then Captain Brathwood for one. One for two became seven for three, when Alec Athanes also fell for a duck before Kevin Hodge was sent back for three at four for 19. And Hazelwood, believe it or not, has now got the first four. It's incredible stuff. Kirk McKenzie struck four fours in his 26, a top score so far, but fell softly by picking out Labuschagne at short cover. Cameron Green with his first wicket of the match, West Indies five for 40. Graves got 24, but was undone by Nathan Lyon on review. That turning out to be the last action of the day. The Silva unbeaten on 17, West Indies 6 for 73, 22 runs away from making Australia bat again. Yeah, very much the case. Australia in control of the test match, Lance and Mariah. And uh, as I pointed out earlier, I thought the West Indies actually bowled well. I think they can be extremely proud of the bowling performance led by Shamar Joseph, of course. But all the bowlers, I thought, had a good day. Um, Justin Graves, as Gerard pointed out in that rap, quite likely the surprise package. I was impressed with how he bowled as well. 15 overs, 2 for 36. Um, Gudakesh Moti, not quite in the contest, um, but it's early days for the spinner, maybe. But overall, a very good bowling performance from this unit. Yeah, I have to agree with you there, Ricardo. All the bowlers did what they had to do. And I was about to bring up that point about Gurukesh Moti because I know a lot of our team members feels as if, you know, they expect to see Gurukesh Moti not only being economical, but of course, among the wicket takers. And of course, we did not get to see that so far. But Ricardo has been very lenient and he says that, what did you say to the team, Ricardo, that it's okay because his wickets are going to come, right? Yeah, I think Gurakesh Moti is a quality bowler and I think part of the problem, and it has been a problem, 
with Caribbean cricket supporters over the years that once you bring a spinner into the lineup, you expect them to take five wickets every single match yeah, or and, every and single and innings. And you've got to give them time um, and you've got to give more to time. It's the first innings of one match where he did not take any wickets. My goodness me, give the guy a break. Yeah, but can I just add, I'm one of those viewers of cricket like, when I see a spinner come on, I instantly believe that I'm going to get wickets, right? Not discussing Moti or anything in that situation, but I'm just saying, like, when I see a spinner come on, and I think we've been spoiled by, like, Sunil Narayan and they... So, like, when you see a spinner come onto the field, you expect that. And then Gurukesh Moti, the quality that he has displayed previously, it's just something. It's natural to expect that. Yeah, well, Faz has always said that spinners aren't given a fair break in, in West Indies cricket because of the tradition of the four-pronged pace attack and the success that West Indies fast bowlers over time um, have had. So that, that has been a problem. But I do, um, I, I do agree with the point that the bowlers did a good job. Yes. It's just that the batsmen weren't able to replicate. Yeah, and by the way, quickly, Lance, that's, I think, a ridiculous way to look at it, right? Because if you think about it, how many fast bowlers... Have you seen play test matches and gone for one for a hundred, one for ninety yards, one for eighty yards? But they're usually and, forgiven. And they are forgiven yeah, because oh, they have some pace, and people believe that once you have some pace, yeah. sooner or later you're going to be bowling down yeah. teams. It's the same way in football that once you have a player who is willing to do a couple of shifts here and there and run up the field, whether or not they have an end product, everybody goes, "Yeah, man, that one has tremendous talent." Rubbish. Let's get Fazir Mohammed in on this discussion, not the football discussion, but the cricket discussion mm -hmm. and the performance of the West Indies on day number two. Fazir Mohammed, how are you doing? I hope you're in a good mood. Well, let's put it this way. If the mood, depending on the fortunes of the West Indies, have been a terrible mood, but this is one of the realities of the modern era, especially when the West Indies are in Australia. How would you assess day number two of this test match, Faz? It, it was a day of two halves from a West Indies point of view because I, I thought that first session was outstanding with the way the West Indies fought. That, that, the thinking, the process, not just the wickets taken by Shamar Joseph, but that process in which we saw uh, Justin Graves first get a wicket himself and then come in closer and closer in that third slip position because of the, the lack of bounce to Kimar Roach. And the, the way they worked it out was absolutely brilliant. But again, it's about sustaining it, sustaining it. Travis Head is the type of player. He always looks like he's going to get out, yet he always seems to, to really get on top of the bowling once he survives. And, and that made all the difference because we, I think we always suspected any sort of lead. 50 plus, closer to 100, as it turned out, would be a worry for the West Indies. And therefore, what happened in that final session with the West Indies capitulating so badly really wasn't all that surprising. It's, it's very much in keeping with what we've seen so very often from the West Indies at home and especially abroad. Yeah, and I guess some would say if the West Indies could dismiss Australia for 283, then things would always be um, more difficult for them, having only scored 188 in the first innings. But I want to give a lot of credit to the, the West Indies boarding attack fans because we have seen in the past, and even speaking specifically to tours in Australia, where the Australians have gotten a ton load of runs, and the West Indies batsmen haven't been able to follow suit and our bowling um, w was poor as well. But that wasn't the case last night. I wonder as well how much credit you would give to the captain, Craig Brathwaite, and how well he um, shepherded the, the bowling lineup um, on a helpful surface, but against a high quality Australian batting lineup. Craig Brathwood is always coming for criticism for being too cautious and lacking in innovation, being too defensive, very much in, in the mindset of his batting at the top of the order. But I think this time around, you have to give him credit. Uh, as I mentioned, that, that the way they worked out that dismissal of, uh, of Marsh and, and, and really just generally the way he used his resources, yes, the talk will be about Moti, but, but again, I think uh, you all covered that, that ground very effectively, so there's no need to go there. I thought he did quite well. And the important thing, lady and gentlemen, is to understand once again that when you're playing just two test matches and you, you struggle in the early ones, as it very rarely happens for the West Indies, there's no coming back. Whereas if you were playing three tests or four tests or five tests, 
and, and had matches in between, which doesn't happen anymore. We appreciate that reality, but we also appreciate the manner in which the game has now gone, where only Australia, England, and India play five test series, that there's really no room for these players to develop their skills in an Australian setting in Test match cricket, probably for the next five or six, five or six years, because West Indies are not in demand anymore, and and therefore you have that situation. So, really, it, it, it's one in which uh, the players have limited scope, limited opportunity to to really develop themselves in these circumstances, in these conditions. And as you said quite correctly, just over a year ago, the West Indies were in Australia for two Test matches, and the Aussies batted for virtually the, the first two days. Of, the, of those tests and, and won comfortably in the end. So th this bowling effort w w was certainly very, very commendable. Yeah, and Faz, just to move away a bit now from the bowling effort, you touched on it briefly when you spoke about Craig Brathwaite being cautious, of course, you know, um, when batting and, of course, making his decisions as captain. What did you make of the manner of the dismissals for the Windies batsmen? A number of different things here, Barai. First and foremost, and we've talked about Josh Hazelwood already. You know that is the line he's going to bowl. And again, Tejaran Chanderpaul played at it, got the outside edge, maybe a bit slow reacting. We, we saw that in the dismissal as well of Kavim Hodge. He seemed to be on the move going into the drive and therefore edge to slip. Uh, Bradford, he does play that way. And again, credit to the Australians because he does have that jerky, stodgy way of playing, pushing half forward. It got a bit of seam movement, took the, the, the inner face of the bat and was a very good catch taken. Uh, certainly for Travis Head, he was quite some distance away at short leg that allowed him to react, but still it was a very good catch. But overall, what you're seeing again is a, a situation where players with talent Players with, obviously with ability, with shot-making ability, but lack the know-how of batting for long periods, lack that, that comprehensive understanding based on actual match experience of what is required to take on this type of disciplined bowling for, for long periods because getting caught at extra cover, short extra cover, as happened to McKenzie, the, these sorts of situations speak to that, that lack of awareness of the situation that you're in, where basically you've got to occupy the crease, yes, you've got to score runs, but you've got to be mindful of the situation that you're facing, as we saw with that hook shot from Athenes, and, and there, that point I was making about Kevin Hodge not really being to the pitch of the ball and driving, the Aussies will eat you up, breakfast, lunch and dinner, playing like that. So again, it's about whether or not these players will have the opportunity to benefit from this exposure because it's going to be a heavy defeat, likely as well in the second test match in Brisbane next week. Will they be able to really have the chance to benefit from this sort of exposure? Yeah, and as far as you know, I want to backpedal just a bit because um, as things now stand, there is hardly any positives for the West Indies outside of how diligently the, bowler, the bowlers took on the, the task yesterday. And I want to emphasize that without Travis Head's innings, this game could have looked completely different. We talk about in batting partnerships being, being the key, but there weren't many significant partnerships because the best partnership the Aussies had would have been the stand between Stark and Travis Head, only 54 runs. And outside of uh, Travis's uh, century, I think... Kawaja with 45 was the next best scorer. I'm saying that to say that outside of Travis Head's pivotal 100, this game could look completely different. It could have. But the point is, and again, as you mentioned, Kawaja, remember he was dropped on three. Yes. A relatively, relatively straightforward chance to Joshua De Silva. So, so again... It, it's about really grasping your opportunities. I thought the West Indies bowled well. Yes. I, I, I really, not just Shamar Joseph, and credit to him as well. I think Shamar Joseph is going to be a real shining light. Whether it's for the West Indies or some franchise is going to snap him up. The <laughs> fact that he took a bow to the audience after taking the five wicket hole tells me that this is a young man who loves the big stage. He's not overawed by it. He's not daunted by it. Uh, you're hearing a lot of condescending remarks about him coming from, from the bush and the, being scared of heights and being afraid of an escalator, and all sorts of comments. But I think if you cast all of that aside, 
you've got here another case of a young player with an appetite for the big stage. And therefore, the concern will be maybe some franchise might want to snap him up. But to, to get back to your specific point, Lance, I think the West Indies bowling, if you think about it, when you think of the resources that are available, if Jaden Seals gets fully fit once again and challenges Kimar Roach for his place, you, you've got there the resources that could have the West Indies consistently competitive. But again, Lance, it depends on whether or not the authorities will pre prepare surfaces in the Caribbean that will be similarly encouraging. And you know that has been a constant bugbear. And, and, and therefore, there, there are many angles to this particular discussion. But yes, to your specific point, the West Indies bowlers, I think, did, did themselves immense credit with the way they, they performed in the first innings. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize the point that we've already made about the kind of star quality that we're seeing from Shamar Joseph. Because uh, I got the distinct impression to when he got his first wicket, an illustration there that his teammates love him because that catch by Justin Graves at slip was a tremendous catch. It was a brilliant catch. And when he took it, none of his teammates went to him. Everyone <laughs> ran directly to Shamar Joseph. And it was, to me, an indicator that his teammates love him. And there is a, a, a kind of impact that he has made immediately with this team, that he has endeared himself to not only his teammates, but as you said, as illustrated by his bow to the to the, to the to the fans, that he does have some star quality about him. And I think um, he could not have asked for a better start to his career internationally. Absolutely. And, and therefore, whoever's around him, whoever's guiding him, whoever's ever mentoring him, whether it's back home in Barakara, whether it's in Georgetown, whether it's with the squad right now, whether there's any mentor that he looks up to, they should remind him, as Ron Kanai reminded Brian Lara, after his 277 in the Sydney Test match of 1993, that your next inning starts at zero, and therefore his next spell starts at naught for naught, and it could be a very different experience. So, so therefore, it's about, yes, enjoying the moment, enjoying the, the adulation, reveling in the conditions, which he hardly would have ever experienced anywhere in the Caribbean, which he did, of course, in South Africa, which is why he was so successful. But ultimately, it's about someone who wants to be part of the action. And when you have someone like that, who is not overawed by the challenge, who yearns for the contest and revels in the atmosphere, that is someone who you think can go very, very far in the game, whether internationally for the West Indies or, as, as always seems more than likely now, with some franchise somewhere in the world. Well, Fazir Mohammed, we surely hope that his next spell does not start in the second test because that would mean that the West Indies would likely have lost by an innings in this opening match and it would be over by lunch on day number three and we're hoping that it will go beyond lunch. Of course, Faz, we had predicted that it would end in three days. Um, I don't know if Lance and Mariah still think that we will go to a fourth day. Um, that would require some heroics, maybe from Shamar Joseph at number 11. Um, but it looks as if we're on course to be right, Faz. Not that I'm gloating. He is no, gloating. You, you, never, you never gloat at all. You know, just very quickly, when this happens, when the West Indies are six weeks down for next to nothing, very often against Australia, we all stages always remember a seventh wicket partnership of 347 unbroken against Australia in 1955, the first match that Tony Cozier ever covered as a 15-year-old journalist. So even as unlikely as it is, we live in hope. Yeah. Thank you for that, Faz. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Faz, for giving Lance and Mariah and the entire West Indies hope. Let's go to a break on the Sportsman Zone. We'll be back with more. Ready?